Has everybody here received the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Yeah, yeah so if, if the answer is, I'm not sure, then you should come up for prayer at the end of the service today, and we'll pray that it becomes real, real in your life and evident. If you said yes to Christ, if you're a Christian and you were born again, then the Holy Spirit is with you because that's who empowered you to say that, right? That's what the Bible teaches us. So you, you might just be living in a disconnected relationship with something that's already inside of you. And boy, the more you can cultivate that relationship, nothing but good things happen when you do that. So that's what we'll talk about today. And uh, I have a couple of important things I want to say about the role of Holy Spirit and the way we can interact with him. But I don't think this will be the last week that, that I'll be talking about this. But it's especially important. And I had given you that one chart. Um, I think it's been about over the last seven weeks, right? Because I wanted you to realize that uh, on the on the calendar of the Hebrew people, Pentecost was a feast that was celebrated. And it was because that's what they celebrated, Moses going up and getting the Ten Commandments and, and getting the law and, and being given that, that compass in the way they should live their lives. How much more should we celebrate, right? If Moses went up to the mountain and brought down the law, but Jesus went up into heaven and brought down Holy Spirit. He gave us Holy Spirit. He said, it's actually good if I leave, because if I leave, then the Father can send the Comforter. Right? I'm glad about that. Because in my own strength, you know, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to do it as well as God would do it through me. Right? Are you with me? I want more, Lord. I want more of your spirit. I want to be hungry. We posted a video this week of uh, part of the conference of, at Chuck Pierce's church, and it was a group from Nigeria, T.Y. Bello, and one of the men that were singing with her gave a prophetic word while they were doing this song. He said, I'm, I'm reminded of the book of Judges and the men that were with Gideon. And there were many men, but only 300 were kept as the army. Remember this? And he said, they, the, the ones that just put their face right in the water and drank were the ones that he kept as, as the soldiers. And he said, why? Why would God have used that as, as, the, as the point of distinction to pick them? And he said, because thirsty people don't need a cup. <laughs> And uh, they just go off on, on quite a beautiful prophetic prayer, song, prophetic word. And it's a really good thing to remember. Education level, our IQ level. You know, if you needed to be Einstein to be a Christian, I guess most of us would be in trouble, right? <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with being studious and studying the word and being a Berean and checking scripture and reading commentaries. I highly recommend all of that. But that shouldn't be taking higher preference over the presence and the power of God in our lives because often our logical mind will get in the way of faith and, and we'll, we'll stop because if we can't figure it out, we won't move forward. So often people that are less complicated and just say, well, if the Lord said it, I believe it and I'm going to act on what I believe, do better than the big intellects, right? Anyway, so it says in Luke 24, 47, you must go into all the nations. We call this the Great Commission, right? Go into all the nations and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins so that they will turn to me. Start right here in Jerusalem, for you're my witnesses and have seen for yourselves all that has transpired. And can we say this part together? I will send the fulfillment of the Father's promise. One more time. I will send the fulfillment of the Father's promise. That was Holy Spirit, right? Jesus had been telling them all along that that was going to happen. And now he's saying that fulfillment is, we're in the season right now where that fulfillment of the promise of God is going to come to pass. And it's so profound because they were so used to being told to go to the temple to experience the presence of God. And now they're being told, your body is going to be the temple of the presence of God. That would have been a disconnect for a lot of people because the holy God... And some of us might have thought, he's angry with us because we sin. He's not angry with us. He loves us. And he wants to be with us all the time. And I want to just say a word to the men. In our culture, it's, it's considered a weakness to ask for help. And that's not, no man wants to be called weak in our culture here. It's not weak to ask God for help, okay? So if you have an aversion to prayer, don't have an aversion to prayer. That's just being a son with a good father. 
he does, he's not shut down for business. We don't have to call Dyfus on God because he's neglecting us. He's saying, you have not because you're not asking. He's not going to force his way in. And you, know, you might be like, well, I don't want to bother him. He's really busy, and I don't have such a big problem. He's got unlimited bandwidth, man. He's got a, a data plan that, that, that's got no match to it. Can you put the mic on? So since he's talking about prayer, we're starting a class on prayer starting June 1st on Tuesdays. I'm going to be preaching. Uh, Kathy Bixell over there. Awesome. You're going to have something to awesome. say about it. So men, women always show up. So men, we're, we want you to come out. Okay. Yes. Starting Tuesday nights, 7 Tuesday p.m. Night. And I have a feeling we'll stay in here uh, instead of going there because it's just been so rich to be in here in the midweek service. Not that there's anything wrong with the other building, but I'm not sure yet. But that's starting this, is it this? No, not this Tuesday, right? June 1st, right? So we got a little time. All right. Sorry, I should have had a slide up for that one. My wife is a good person to learn about for, for prayer, for the topic of prayer. <laughs> So he said, I will send the fulfillment of the Father's promise to you. So stay here in Jerusalem, in the city, until you are clothed with the mighty power of heaven. Yeah. Just love that, the way he was phrased in, in the Passion, because it gives us the indication that if it's clothes, we can take it off, and we shouldn't take it off. In fact, in the New Testament, the Bible actually exhorts us to put off the old man and put on the new man. And that's what happened to the disciples. They were still suffering with the weakness of their flesh. You couldn't even tarry one hour with me. I, I perceive that the spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak, right? So there we go. Even there, help me, Lord, to stay more focused on you all day long, every day. Uh, I want to be clothed with that mighty power of heaven. It's available to me. So this is how it's, that was in Luke 24. Luke wrote the book of Acts. So uh, chapter one of Acts is a continuation of the gospel in, in many ways. And Jesus here is speaking, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait until you receive the gift I told you about, the gift the Father has promised. I love this part. For John baptized you in water, but in a few days from now, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Right? So we get that picture of the, of the comparison of how Holy Spirit comes upon us as we leave Egypt, as we leave the sinful part of our lives, we get baptized with a power that gives us the ability to do things we can't do in our own strength. Okay, you're with me? Oh, sorry, Ray. I might have stepped on a wire or something. My bad. <laughs> I'll stay back here. And then if you remember in early uh, chapter 3 of, of uh, John, uh, Luke's gospel, you know, we all know John 3.16, but Luke 3.16 is pretty powerful too. <laughs> and this is John the Baptist was speaking about Jesus. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Yeah. How about, I, I've got an idea. The devil's trying to mess with us. Yeah, you have them up there. Just work it from up there. Uh, he, you know, like I've said often, Jesus didn't even have a microphone, so all this technology is just an, an extra benefit. He did pretty good without a microphone, right? <laughs> so how about this baptism with fire? Like, whoa, that's a powerful image, isn't it? Uh, John baptized you with water, but the one who's coming is going to baptize you with fire. Yeah. The Holy Spirit and fire. What a great thing to focus on, right? If you say somebody's fired up, yeah. their furnace is burning. Yeah. And uh, I remember a story about one of the, the Wesley brothers. When they were on their way over here from England, they were with, uh, I think it was the Moravians, if I remember the story correctly. And it looked like the ship was going to sink. And and the Wesleys were getting like nervous, and the Moravians were all joyous and praying and happy, if I'm from remembering the story right. And, and he said, aren't you concerned? And, and they said, oh, no. Uh, we live for God every day. We light ourselves on fire and, and let other people watch us burn. It's the way I'm remembering it. <laughs> There's some kind of eternal perspective that you can keep with the Lord. Amen? So in Acts chapter 2, Verses 1 and 2, so we were in 1 just now, now we're going to 2, which you would think on Pentecost Sunday. In the Amplified, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all assembled together in one place, when suddenly there came what? Sound. Stop right there. A sound. Right? It's not wind. It's a sound. Like, I've seen some of the movies that try to depict this, and their hair's all blowing around. 
you know? And I could see, you know, how you could read it that way, just not what it says. It says a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and in this, in Amplified, it says like a, the rushing of a violent tempest blast. What does that remind you of? When the world had no form and was void, God spoke, and there was a sound that the world calls the Big Bang. <laughs> Well, this is another bigger bang in a lot of ways because it's not a theory. <laughs> this was the presence of God available to every human being. It says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And look how ironic it is that of all these Pharisees, they're saying, oh, no, it's, it's not God. They're drunk. And who is a Peter of all people who stands up? The one who denied Christ stands up and says, oh, no, they're not drunk as you suppose. This was spoken by the prophet Joel that in the last days, remember this? I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So there's a bigger bang here because the fact that, that the earth was under a curse from the sin of Adam, of Adam and Eve has now been reversed by the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And for 40 days, he showed himself to over 500 people. And then he said, wait for the power. Stay in Jerusalem and wait for the power. It's going to be fire. It's going to be my spirit and fire. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And fire, you know, in the Old Testament, is a purging process. And if you read the King James, I'm, anybody else get the King James when you first became a Christian many years ago? <laughs> you know, I love it. It's great. It's just sometimes easier in, in more modern language, but then they talked a lot about the dross, about uh, the refiner's fire yeah. that, that would bring up all the impurities of, of the silver as they were trying to form silver. They would boil it first, and as they boiled it, the dross, the poison, all the impurities of the silver would come up to the surface and they would skim it off. Wow. Yeah, like wow, because that means we have to say, Lord, turn up the heat. Yeah. <laughs> If he's a fire inside of us, we shouldn't want anything in here that's defiling or that's different from what he wants to source in our lives. But how many know that stuff pops up every once in a while, doesn't it? Come on, be honest. I'm not the only one here. You have a judgmental thought about other people. That's not cool. <laughs> you're doing this without really doing it, but you're thinking that in your brain. And the Lord will just humble you when you do that and, and show you that that person has a whole lot more than you realize. And that's, you know, I'm going to talk about that today because it's one of the best ways Holy Spirit can help us is to give us perspective on our, our relationships with other people. And that, you know, that's been a very hot topic in, in America. For the last year, we've, we've gone through probably the most contentious election in, in the, maybe in the history of the country that I'm aware of, but certainly in my lifetime. And there were some really harsh things being said between people, including Christians. And it's not to say you should get emotional about these things, but you'll be much more effective if you follow the model of Jesus, who spoke the truth but did it in love. And the Holy Spirit will help you do this by giving you a little more patience and asking the Lord right in the middle of a conversation to, to, to flow through me in this conversation. I don't want to rush into... Well, I already know what you're doing, and it's wrong. He'll, he'll give you a better way. He'll give you a higher level way of communicating with other people if you ask him. So, sound of heaven like a, a rushing of a mighty, I'm sorry, a violent tempest blast filled the whole house in which they were singing. And I, I already quoted it, but it was Genesis 1. The earth was without form, an empty waste. Darkness was upon the face of the great deep. The Spirit of God was moving, hovering, brooding. Moving, hovering, brooding. Do you think that changed? Is he still moving and hovering and brooding? Yeah. Touch Sheets does a great teaching about that as well. The hovering presence of the Lord is with us, available to be tapped into if we don't just lock in with our logic and include him in our thought process. Logic's great, right? I, I don't want to be driving over a bridge that wasn't designed by an engineer, right? Like, we need that. But human beings are not bridges, <laughs> right? We're alive. We're dynamic. We're moving. We're changing. The bridge stays there and keeps us alive. But you don't work with people like an engineer would work on building a bridge. It's much too dynamic. No offense to any engineers. We're happy that you do your job. 
<laughs> the Spirit of God was moving, hovering, and brooding over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So the first thing of creation was sound. The word let. Let there be light. Hallelujah. That same source placed that in us, and now we can make a sound that lines up with heaven. That's amazing. You didn't have to earn it. You couldn't qualify. Nothing you could have done in your own works would have been good enough to qualify you to do that. It's by grace. And we all know the, the definition probably have heard that it's unmerited favor. So you got it as a gift, not as something that you could have earned. But it's also, uh, there's another dimension to grace that you can think of that's the supernatural power that comes in you to do things that you're not able to do in the natural. And when people have gone through difficult seasons, on the back row there, under the sign. So good to see you. We worked together many years ago. So good to see you. Supernatural grace. So uh, a friend of mine, when, when he got married, his wife got pregnant, and after she gave birth to their child, it triggered multiple sclerosis and kept her in a wheelchair for the next 30 years. And it was devastating, right? Like, whoa, everything that they had hoped for in their plans had to shift. I mean, they were believing for healing, but it didn't happen. But I never heard him complain. I've been friends with him for 20 years. Never heard him complain. He's a strong Christian. But that was the grace of God, a supernatural ability to do something you couldn't do in your own strength. You could say that about Corey Ten Boom when she had to forgive the prison guard right afterwards. There's so many famous Christians that have gone above and beyond what the natural ability could ever give us. But remember that about Holy Spirit. It's, it's not just goosebumps and, and prophetic words. As wonderful as that is, as wonderful as open heaven and being able to hear the Lord is, it's still a, it's a deeper source of godly strength and godly power as opposed to carnal responses to people. There appeared to them tongues resembling fire which were separated and distributed and which settled on each one of them. And I've already touched on this a little bit, right? They were filled with, diffused throughout their souls, the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other different languages, other tongues, right? And it was a known language. It wasn't babbling. And it was actually the known languages of the people that were in the city of Jerusalem. They were there because they were celebrating Pentecost. It was a holiday. Why isn't it a holiday in the Christian church? Why is Easter and Christmas the two things that most people celebrate the most? This should be up there with those. This is a, ma a miraculous thing that happened that you, you get no Holy Spirit without the resurrection of Jesus. Right? Yeah, we needed the birth of Jesus. Yes, we needed the resurrection to defeat death. But now we have this amazing atomic power source on the inside of us. That's worth a holiday in my book. So sign a petition. We'll get a holiday going. <laughs> so what's about the fire? The Spirit kept giving them clear and loud expression in each tongue that was appropriate in those words for those people. And you might think back to the, to the mercy seat. This would have been so easy for the Jews of the time that had been uh, that had been used to the temple process that there was a place called the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, Right? As they went through in the book of Exodus, you watch them, they have to set up that Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies, and there's three stages. And it's, it's a very elaborate thing that God did and, and, and explained to them why that was important. And it sat right in the center of the camp, and all the tribes camped out around it. It was all symbolic that God had to be at the center of everything that they did. right? And when King David came and went and got the Ark of the Covenant, where did he bring it? right back into Zion and put it outside where everybody could access it, right? A prophetic picture of what it would be like to have access to God's presence. Not behind the veil. When Jesus gave up his spirit, what happened in the temple? The veil was torn from top to bottom. And that meant that what used to be hidden back here because of the curse of sin has now been made available to all of you. And Bill Johnson likes to say, not, not just to let you in, but to let God out. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Lord. So if you went to the Old Testament, you would see in Leviticus 16, it says that the priest must take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense. That's what we do when we worship, right? Two handfuls of incense of our worship. 
to the Lord. And this position is, I'm yielded. This is what they do with prisoners, right? Put your hands up. <laughs> so I'm surrendering to you, Lord. And my worship acts like incense that's burning in this temple. And it was a holy place. And, and the Ark of the Covenant is where the fire had to stay all the time. That fire could not go out. How about you? Ever feel like the fire's starting to flicker a little bit? That's a great time to call another believer. That's a great time to say, hey, I'm struggling with something right now. I, f I can't fully identify it, but I need you to pray with me to stoke the flame in my heart. I'm feeling it flickering a little bit. I'm losing hope. Nobody wants to live a hopeless life. We were counseling somebody recently, and that's, that's what she said. She said, I had no hope. And, and boy, that's exactly where the devil wants you. Don't go there. All right, so they lifted up the incense, two hands, took it inside the veil, and he put the incense on the fire before the Lord. So that's one way you could look at the picture of what happened on the day of Pentecost, because each one had this fire over them now, symbolizing that the Holy of Holies now rests in your heart, and you are carrying that power source with you, but it doesn't override your natural ability. You have to choose to yield to the power of the Holy Spirit in you. And why wouldn't we do that? Because then we can't do what we want to do. We have to do what God wants us to do. Thanks, Nate. Didn't get a lot of, didn't get a lot of amens on that. Maybe this will stretch you, but God wants you to do what you want to do as long as what you want to do is what he wants you to do. <laughs> so he, uh, he gave you an ability. I'm looking at Joe Bellotta back there in, in the corner. He preached uh, while we were away. Well, earlier this month. It was awesome. Great job. Well, you know, he has a calling on his life. And, and he, when, when he's doing what he wants to do, you know, the Bible says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. He puts them in, but it's also what you're born for. And that's when you flourish. I, I mean, you probably know Christians like that, that they're in their zone. They, they found what their gifting is, and they're operating in that gifting. And look, there's another great picture here. Uh, of, of people praying with that fire over, over them. But your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. And we're, we're warned about not defiling our temple because many forms of sin is through our flesh. And when we allow the devil to win in our flesh, that defiles our temple. And I won't unpack that, but it's, it's a really serious scripture that says, you know, don't do that, right? Keep reminding yourself that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So then I just wondered, how did we get from the Temple of the Holy Spirit to Church Lady on Saturday Night Live? Like, uh, that's who I saw when I was growing up and before I was a Christian. You, you get it, right? Like what the world is trying to make Christians out to be is just, uh, I, I, can you do that next one? I don't know. Maybe they don't have this one. But uh, like that's the last thing in the world that we would ever want other people to think that God is closed-minded, doesn't want you to have any fun. Like, this is, what the, this is how the world mocks Christians. And, you know, there must be a reason. Like, they didn't just make it up. So maybe if we were modeling something different, then they wouldn't do this. I mean, they probably would still mock because the same thing. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. So they don't want to yield to God. But look, let's not make it easy for them. By being closed-minded people, let's, let's be people of life. Let's be people of charity. Let's be people that, that resolve conflict and not create conflict and, and operate in the presence and power and the, and the character of the Lord. Because I was sure glad that people fought through and got to me before I knew the Lord, right? They loved me enough to keep putting up with my stuff and, and just kept praying for me and talking to me and trying to convince me. Can we go to the next one? In Matthew 23, in, in the voice, boy, is this a warning. Uh, <laughs> it's, this is Jesus talking. And it's the people he's talking to are the Pharisees, and they are not operating in the power of the Spirit. Okay? They have been corrupted. And God just is grieved by injustice, especially in the priesthood. Right? It's like us. We get grieved when we see that a judge was corrupt. The very person who was hired and, and took an oath to enforce the law is breaking the law. If you saw the movie Serpico, it was a whole division of the police department. Everybody except this one guy 
was taking bribes from the drug dealers. And he almost died for standing up and trying to do something different. And we never would have known the story. But look at what Jesus says to the Pharisees. This could have been in red letters. Woe to you, you teachers of the law and Pharisees. There's such a gulf between what you say and what you do. You lock the door of the kingdom of heaven right in front of everyone. You won't enter the kingdom yourselves, and you prevent others from doing so. I thought he was a nice, gentle Jesus. Was he having a bad day? Did he have, not have his coffee that morning? Didn't get his tax refund? Look at this. This is serious. You steal the homes from under widows while you pretend to pray for them. You will suffer great condemnation for this. That's the Lord speaking to the priesthood of the day. And look, if you step into a pulpit, if you step in to a position of saying that you're going to teach other people, you're held to a high standard by the Lord. You know, this is not Peter and Trisha's church, right? This is the Lord's church. We're the stewards of his flock. Not, we're not the groom. We're the best man at the wedding. We're putting the hand of the bride in the hand of the groom right? We're not to take on any prestige about that. It's this. It's serving. The greatest title, serve. Downward mobility. <laughs> you traverse hills and mountains and seas to make one convert, and when he converts, you make him much more a son of hell than you are. Gentle Jesus. Gentle Jesus. No. Turns over the tables. Right? Like, no, this is not okay. And, and it's not being led by the Holy Spirit. And if there's ever a group of people that should be led by the Holy Spirit, it's the leaders of the church. Right? Because as soon as they get corrupted and start making it about their ministry, the people in, in the seats who are often vulnerable could get hurt and led in the wrong direction and turn away from God because the representative got corrupted. So pray for your pastors, okay? Wave your hand, huh? So they know who to pray for. <laughs> Me and her could use a lot of prayer. And then Jesus was warning the disciples to say, this is not how we operate. The what you're seeing the Pharisees do is not the way we operate. In Matthew 20, 25, it says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions use their authority over them. It must not be that way among you. Right, so we would just say in modern language, don't pull rank on people. Everybody's equal. Typically in corporate America, you're at the table because you've, you've refined a skill and you're adding something. But if, but if that skill is in package with personality and uh, emotional intelligence and an ability to interact with your team, you may last for a little while, but you're not going to last long. So you have to consider your gift is not the only thing that makes you valuable. It's your ability to go with the other team and be involved on teams because nobody can do it alone. So it's not just your gifts. It's also your character. That's in corporate America too, but especially in the church, right? It can't be this way. You're not pulling rank on each other. There's no junior Holy Spirit and, you know, I won't go there. Never mind. <laughs> Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Among you, who wants to be great among you, must be serving. That's what Jesus says. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. I know you've all heard this verse. I know you're familiar with the concept. And yet we, we don't see the church as powerful as it could be. Because this ego, this hubris creeps in and we feel like we're competing with other people for a limited pot. And it's like, no, if you are operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, there's going to be lots of needs for what you can do in the community, right? Like the vision that God gives you, the ability to, to press in and solve problems, that's a supernatural thing. And the world has tilted in the direction of machines and logic and programs. and It's, it's all good as far as like the medical advances that have been made, but not good in the interacting between people. So you could think about an obvious one in the New Testament would be that the Pharisees were upset that Jesus healed on the Sabbath, right? Have you ever done anything like that? Maybe, right? Like, 
we get so caught up in thinking that everything has to fit in this little box and there's only one possible way you could look at it. And it doesn't mean you're supposed to work on the Sabbath. Like, that's not the point. And he gave a very quick example, remember? He said, you guys, if, you're, if your horse was caught in a ditch, or you'd bring, it, you'd bring water to your animal. So what? Like, I shouldn't be taking care of God's child? You're considering that work? Amen. See what happens? It's, it's almost like a learned dependence in the priesthood. This is what can happen, is that we don't want them to grow too much in the audience because then they won't need us anymore. <laughs> I'm not trying to cast aspersions on anybody. It's just a tendency that, that can happen to anybody. It can happen to a psychologist. You might know the answer for the person, but if you get them healed, you lost a client. Conflict of interest. We want you all healed, completely powerful in the Lord. Go start your own church. We'll help you. We'll help you learn <laughs> some of the tuition payments we made. Uh, so, look, it's not a limited pie. There's so many hurting people that need the Lord. We should all feel like we have a platform to be discipled and to grow in our gifting so that we can be all God created us to be. So let me bring Einstein, who's not really a... Uh, a known Christian, but he was a known smart guy. And he said, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. Oh! Ouch! That hurts. Well, he died in 1955, so man, like, you know, I don't know when he said this, but nothing of what we're going through now is uh, anywhere near what he would have seen other than he saw it prophetically. You know, he's, he was a brilliant scientist, but he was also a musician. And I'll just kind of plant that seed for you out there that um, people tend to think about the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. I'm, I'll just show you a picture of it. So we would think that the left hemisphere is right here, analysis, logic, ideas, facts, math, training, truth, right? One truth. And then the spirit is creativity, intuition, arts, crea creation. What is it? I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess creation, like a new idea, innovation, feelings, and imagination. If I had to ask you which part, which hemisphere is more important, what would you say? Left? Raise your hand if you think it's left. A lot of people. And you think I'm setting you up. I'm really not trying to set you up. I'm sorry. So if you didn't say left, that means you're either going to say right or you don't know. But the, the culture that we live in, 99% plus all say it's the left hemisphere. And that the right hemisphere is all just the fluffy stuff that maybe we'll get to music and artwork and, and all this stuff that doesn't get anything done. Right. It's about product, being productive. Time is money. And yeah, you can be so busy that you become a generation of idiots. Wow. When, when it knows how to... How, if you're making your decision based off of algorithms that are not human beings... It's a bad idea, and he knew it even back then that there was going to be this tendency. And look, you could think of the verse, God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So it's not just the, the left brain logical spreadsheet. Everything has to have one answer. No, we're all way too dynamic to live your life that way. It's spirit and truth. Now, we all know people that got a little flaky with too much of the spirit and weren't grounded. They weren't tethered to the grounding of the Word of God, and they operated you know, outside the realm of the Holy Spirit. They had some spirit on them, but it wasn't holy. <laughs> Don't worry about that. They'll say sometimes, well, all the people in your church, man, they're just like, Judge Sheets calls it full contact worship. <laughs> do they really have to do that? Like, is that really the Lord? And it's like, you know what, close your eyes. Don't worry about other people. You worship while, while you're here. And, he said, but I might get hit by a flag if I close my eyes. <laughs> Sorry about that if that ever happened. We don't condone that behavior of hitting people with your flag. But we do condone, we do condone people worshiping God. And I will be more dignified than this. That's what David said. And if you knew the stories of the people... You'd be, you'd be worshiping right along with them and dancing with them. And, and the, the things that people in this church have overcome, man, you couldn't, you couldn't say enough celebration would get it done. So anyway, you know, there's this balance. And 
The Bible says that if we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap corruption. But if we sow to the spirit, we reap life. So which one do you want? Right? Doesn't mean we don't need the bridge of standing. We do. We need that truth. But I'm just going to give you an example. Uh, one other thing that, that Einstein said was the int intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind is a faithful servant. Catch this. It's very profound. He's talking about the intuitive mind being that right hemisphere. He is an atomic physicist. So you'd think if anybody understood that it's that logical piece matters, he's like, no, that's just the faithful servant. The intuitive mind is where the creative ideas come. That's how I figured out the theory of relativity, he probably would have said. And he was a musician. He played the violin. And he called it the harmony of the spheres, the left and right. So he'd be stuck on a math problem, and he would go play his violin. And while he was playing the violin, the answer to the math problem would come. There you go. So if it worked for him, it might work for us too, right? I'll go quickly now. I want to just end with a, an example of how Jesus put this into operation. I'll give you John 16, 7 says, It's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And then Philippians, it says, This is how you, Lisa Melillo on the front row here, this is how you should think among your, for yourself and among yourselves with the mind that you have because you belong to the Messiah, who, though in God's form did not regard his equality with God as something that he ought to exploit. What would we call that? Pulling rank. He, if anybody ever could have pulled rank, boy, I'll tell you what, Jesus had the goods, and he didn't pull rank. He loved people. And, and my reason for, for telling you this is, and I mean, you can go to that next slide, we'll end on this one, maybe one more, but like it's the point of, well, I'll just say a phrase, and you'll know what I mean. The prodigal son. How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, it's used, like, frequently. You've guess we've all heard, if you've been saved any length of time, especially as it relates to salvation, right? The son in the pigsty is like a person who's caught up in sin, but they come to the senses and they come back to the father. What a beautiful symbol of the orphan returning home, right? But maybe there's a little more to this than just that. That's a truth that's contained inside a bigger package. And, and part of the clue is right here at the beginning of the chapter. It says, all the tax collectors and sinners, say it with me. Hmm, drew near to him. How many people are drawing near to you? What was it about Jesus that caused sinners to draw near to them, but not draw near to the Pharisees? What was it? presence of Holy Spirit. He carried it with him. Remember when he came up and he got baptized like a dove? Well, look into that one sometime. It was another one of those violent rending of the heavens, like it says in Isaiah, rend the heavens and come down. It came in the form of a dove, but it just, that's how God operates. So this picture is pretty, bit of a conflict of two camps, because the next one says, the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So maybe this is where the Pharisees were looking and the tax collectors and sinners were over here and Jesus loved Pellegrino. I'm sure he did because uh, he was tuned in to the Holy Spirit. And the Pharisees and the scribes are watching him interact with these losers. Tax collectors and sinners, like, you, you could just picture them like, oh, we thought he had potential. We thought he could be somebody. But he's not hanging out with the right people. Ooh, don't say that. I was one of those not right people. <laughs> Somebody loved me in. This man receives sinners and eats with them. See, because that challenges their, their hierarchy. And it's exactly what they should have been doing. Now, we know he loves these tax collectors and sinners, but he, does he also love them? Yeah, you're all pretty quick to say that. That's great. And then it says, he spoke this parable to them, and it just says this parable, but it's not just the parable of the prodigal son. There's more to it. And, and I'm just, you know, I know I'm out of time, it's, it's noon already, but I'll just take a couple of minutes here to think it, because it applies to our daily living, right? First of all, I don't think he knew in the morning when he was having breakfast that this was going to happen that day. 
I think he lived his life in coordination with heaven and listening to the Father at all times because I don't want you to think he had some special advantage that we don't have. What he did was listen to his Father all day long. And he only did what he heard the Father do and saw the, saw the Father do, heard the Father say, and saw the Father do. Why can't we do that? Well, because I'm not hearing God, so what do I do? Wait until you do. <laughs> it's way better to wait to hear what God says than do the wrong thing. Anybody else know about that one? Lots of tuition payments on that one. So he tells stories within a bigger story. The prodigal son's only part of it, and he's doing it for a reason. He loves these sinners, but he knows if he can get these people straightened out, they got a heck of a power package that will operate for the kingdom, and it did. Nicodemus, there's many of the Pharisees that got saved. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee, right? Man, I'm sure glad he got saved, aren't you? The book of Romans, uh, pretty good. So Jesus is coming up with a plan in his mind that I want to get to both sides, Democrats and Republicans, whichever side you're on. He loves them all. How about us? Oh, sorry. Don't throw anything at me. Could you love somebody in the other political camp? Yeah. You could, you could do that without feeling like you're compromising and agreeing with them. You can have a disagreement with people. So what Jesus does is he... He's telling the story to the Pharisees using the example of the people that he's with. And, and it's really powerful. And it probably deserves more time than we can give it today. But you'll see what I'm saying here in a minute. He spoke this parable to them saying, and I'm just summarizing it, right? The first part of the story was uh, a man who had 100 sheep. He lost one. What did he do? He went and found it. He brought it back. And they had a party. Is that fair? Okay. And then the next one is a woman who had 10 coins, lost a coin, and what? Found it and had a party. The third one is a man who had two sons, lost one, found him, and had a party. See it? One out of 100, one out of 10, one out of two. Who's left? One. The older brother. See it? And the older brother who's left now has to decide. He, he confronts the father and says, wait a minute, you're showing him all this favor when he, he wasted your inheritance and I've been faithful. He doesn't deserve a party. And the father's like, look, my son who was dead is alive, who once was lost is now it's found. We're celebrating, man. Everything I have is yours, but you make your own choice. I'm, I'm filling in some blanks here because we're not told that. But the picture I get is the father's like, all right, you can stay out here if you want to, but I'm going in because we should be able to celebrate that people that made bad decisions can be forgiven and be restored into a new life. So you see this older brother is the Pharisee at the beginning of the story. No, they don't belong in here. They didn't earn it. I had to work for my degrees and my title, and I'm going to pull rank because you don't deserve it. Did anybody here deserve getting saved? Not one of us. Don't you love the grace of God? It couldn't be by your works. Now, look, he's not opposed to effort. He just is opposed to us thinking we can earn it. And you could do this in your relationships. You could... You can ask the Lord for a strategy in every exchange that you have with other people. To the toll collector on the parkway, if you're getting changed, everybody matters to God. Everybody. There was a guy that was working in the lobby at Sloan Kettering in New York City. He became famous because he would walk out from behind the counter and hug the cancer patients that were coming in just to let them know, you're not alone, I'm praying for you. Like, Everybody knew who this guy was, and he, he didn't have a high-status job. Didn't matter. He had God. You have God in you. And it's worth making the effort to try to let him out in the way you interact with everybody, right? We're going to be held to that standard. And look, you know, there, there's, uh, there's many examples of the Christian church not behaving in a Christian way. Many. We repent of that. We have to. We can't say it never happened. It did. But what we can say is we serve a God who wants to show us how to do it right. And we're not going to get caught up in a religious spirit, a bunch of rules and regulations. Trish and I both said, if there was no power in the church, 
we would go back to the old way of living again. That's why we can go forward is because we know there's power to change. And we can act as the go-between for somebody who's hurting to help God speak through us, to get them saved, to get them healed, to get them delivered, to break addictions off their life. We may not be the most perfectly skilled at it, but I can tell you what, we're hungry and we're pressing in and we're not gonna stop trying. We hope you can come with us. <laughs> so let's stand. I told you I'd end with one more verse. Thank you, Dave. I love you too, buddy. I heard a lady named Brene Brown use this example of comparing sympathy to empathy. And Holy Spirit gives us empathy. We actually can feel what other people are feeling as opposed to just feeling sorry for them. And like your friend falls down into a hole and you stand up at the ledge and you go, wow, must be really bad down there in that hole. Hope you get out. No, no, like what you do with empathy is not only get in the hole with them, because if you just stayed in the hole with them, that wouldn't really be helping them, would it? But you get them and you help them out of the hole because you felt what they were feeling. And uh, that's hard to do because you never know when these opportunities are going to come. And you might have to stop what you were doing and focus on this and just hear the Lord in that moment. It happened to me at my, one of my prior jobs in corporate America. A guy knocks on my door. And he says, hey, I'm really sorry if I was getting loud because my office backed up to his office. Turned out he was having an argument with his wife. And I was in the middle of typing numbers in my screen working. And the Lord said, stop what you're doing and look at this guy. And I did. Of course, you learn to hear that one. 20 minutes later, he walked out of the office. I had done marriage counseling with him in a stock brokerage firm. And as he's walking out, the guy across, he goes, hey, I got, I'm going to get a bill from the pastor over here giving me counseling. He was wide open, uh, you know, a secular atheist, dropping left bombs left and right. So, oh no, I'm defiled, I can't talk to you. Like, stop. Jesus was a tough guy, he was a carpenter, man. He was hauling rocks around, it wasn't just wood. This skinny little wimpy string bean Jesus. No, the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? <laughs> So look, don't be, don't take this as a, a militant message. It's like, no, it's a thread from heaven to earth to show you how to deal with this situation at this time for this group of people, right? It's that finely tuned because God loves us all that much. And you know, 1 Corinthians 13, I'm, I'm sure you've heard it read at weddings. It's, it's a popular one at weddings. But think about it in the context of how we interact with ourselves, with the body of Christ, but other people, and maybe... I hope something sinks in here. It says, love is not self-seeking. It's not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. So Jesus could have walked over here and said, you should be ashamed of yourselves. You're representing my father and you're not doing it very well. And you guys over here, if you don't change your life, you're gonna go to hell. You need me. Be more like me. No, I don't think that's too attractive. Not exactly provoking them to jealousy, are you? So love means just stopping what you're thinking and looking at the situation and saying, Lord, help me. What should I do right now, right here? What verse do you want me to use if there is one? One time a mother asked me to counsel her son, and I bought him a pack of cigarettes. Like, that might sound like the worst thing a pastor could ever do. I never met the kid before, and I, I had to ask the Lord like five times, really? You want me to do that? Like, how could that possibly be good? And it's because I, had to, I never met him before, and I didn't want him to think, or God didn't want him to think that I was some holy roller. I came out of the same kind of lifestyle he was still in. So you don't get to talk to people at a heart level until they respect you. I'm not saying buy a pack of cigarettes for anybody, okay? We're not making the 11th commandment here. I'm just saying you have to be open to stretch a little bit on, what, on how you're going to re react to people and interact with them. It doesn't rejoice at injustice or at unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Excuse me. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes and is ever ready to believe the best of every person. That's in the Bible. Democrats and Republicans. Ever ready to believe the best about every person, even your opponent, even the Samaritans. 
I think we should just stop there and just lift our hands and, and say, Lord, I want your spirit having more control over, me, over the decisions that I make. I don't want to be bound by my natural understanding of things. It's bankrupt in so many ways, but, but you will give me the truth of how to interpret the word of God into the current culture because they need life. They need to know truth spoken, but done in love. Help us do our part by starting by believing the best about every person, not jumping to conclusions, not, not forming judgments in our heart about people based on the political party or color of their skin or the level of education they have or the house they live in or the car they drive, all the ways the world has tried to creep in. We say, no, you're no respecter of persons. Each one of us is super valuable in the kingdom of God, and we want to operate in your principles and in your laws, not the operation of this world's laws. So Holy Spirit, we say come in a fresh way to each one of our lives, that you would empower us to live a Christ-like life and existence and have this much care for other people like Jesus did with this series of stories he told. Give us words of knowledge, prophetic signs, healing, signs and wonders to prove that you're real to the people of the world. Not unto us, Lord, but unto your name be all the glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. So just look around for a minute here, okay? This is such a sight to behold to all these people in this church. It's awesome. Let's give the Lord a hand that this COVID thing is ending. Enough! Enough! That's what they say down in South America. So I just want to bless you guys before you leave. Lord, we're so grateful for hungry hearts. I, I pray you bless every one of the people that's here. If there's people here that don't know the Lord, just say a prayer. Just invite him in. He's available. You don't have to hand in your resume and wait for a response. The answer is yes. You can join the family. You can be part of the kingdom of God. We have prayer people here at the altar. Come down. If anything struck a chord in your heart and you want to know more, come, come down to this altar. If not, you have to go come to fellowship. Great. Anything you have to do. I bless you to have an awesome week. Love you all. We'll do part two next week. Have a great day.